I want to welcome everyone to our uh, seminar, Digital Transformation Concept to Execution. I'm Olga Polevaya. I'm a project manager at TSB. TSB is a sponsor of our today's event. Our company is a um, custom software provider. Uh, we offer senior level software developers and professional development teams at 60% of cost compared to local talent. Uh, TSB provides team augmentation, project rescue, or complete team packages. And today, together with our partners, Global uh, Digital and CTO Outsourcing, we prepared the content for this seminar. And thank you, Incita, uh, who helped us to organize this event. Uh, today, we will have uh, three topics. It will be one continuous session. Uh, so, if you have any questions, raise your hands, or we have a Twitter, TSB Seminar is our hashtag, so we can use new technologies to send the questions in the Twitter. If you need to leave the room, uh, please welcome to do that, there is a restroom on the second floor, I don't know if you found it or not. And uh, we are about to start, and I want to invite on this a uh, little stage, our first presenter, uh, Mike McTaggart, with his topic, uh, Digital Transformation. Uh, Mike, as you'll see, is passionate about two things, being a dad and technology. He started his career as an engineer, was part of the dot-com era, and now leads a team of consultants dedicated to digital transformation. His personal focus is on elevating and aligning IT is a partner to the business. So this is a mic. Alrighty. Alrighty, thank you very much. How's everyone doing today? Oh well, good, good. Uh, if you haven't uh, already gotten something to eat, I definitely suggest you get it. It's actually really good. It's really good. I don't know where they got food from. It's pretty good. Um, bio and a little bit about me. Let's see here. If you're going the right direction. Um, yeah, I've been in this business a long time, you know, 20 plus years, which for anyone doing business on the web is you know, a pretty long time. Most of all of that you can get off of LinkedIn though. So there are a couple of things though uh, that I think are probably more important for you to know for our 30 minutes or so together today. First of all, I'm a lifelong geek. This is me about nine years old and I am over the moon to get a Panasonic dot matrix printer. That was what I wanted, a crazy nine-year-old. And if I remember right, this printer, and some of you may remember printers like this, far better at producing decibels of noise than DPI, like printed output, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a complete mess. Uh, the second thing you should know about me uh, is I am a dad. I'm a dad of triplets. They just turned six years old, all girls. Uh, and I only bring this up so that you know I am not easily rattled. You know, not only do I do consulting for a living, but you know, at events like this, which I love doing, uh, you know, interrupt me, you know, tell me you've got a question, disagree with me, tell me your neighbor stole your juice. Like The more that kind of stuff happens, the more totally at home I feel up here. So I want to make this you know, a comfortable thing, a conversation, you know, something we can enjoy learning together. Because let's face it, digital transformation is a complicated thing. And that's what we're talking about. So you know, what is it? Well, it kind of depends on who you ask, right? I mean, we know it's a thing because you know, we in the business know something is a thing when all of these guys launch dedicated blogs on the topic, right? But if you go reading them, well, they all say something different. And it really kind of depends on who you ask. Ask them to define digital transformation. And you go to someone that sells storage, and they're going to talk a lot about big data. Boy, it's all about all the data you've got to store now. You know, we're producing more data per day than blah, 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 blah. If you ask someone that's in switching and routing, well, then it's all about the connected devices. How many connected devices are we going to have? You've got to you know, keep all of those networks together and secure in some way. And so it really depends on who you ask. I'm biased, I'm an ex-software guy, so I'm going to you know, try to set the stage for a, a common definition that we can run off of today. But before we do that, there's one thing that these guys do agree on, and that is that digital transformation is what they call a mega trend. You know, and in the political science kind of world, they call this you know, essentially a change that is so far-reaching 
that it leaves nothing and no one untouched. Doesn't matter if you're small business, entrepreneur, or Fortune 50. An entire nation is going to impact your business, the economics of your business, or even the economics of your country. And in a permanent way, once this change happens, there's no going back. Yeah, and we can agree that we're starting to see some of the impacts of that already. But for today, there's this big change, a lot of facets of the change. We're going to try to narrow that down and start with a common definition. So I propose, uh, oh, let me touch this. Smarter people than me have weighed in on this topic. And this is really speaking to why do we care about this megatrend? You know, so head of Cisco, John Chambers, said... In the next 10 years, 40%, two out of five businesses will die if we don't adjust to this change, if we don't embrace this mega trend. And he said this in 2015, by the way. So on his 10-year clock, we're already a little over two years in. Okay. So it's something we need to pay attention to. So I propose today, we start out, at least for the next 30 minutes, defining digital transformation as a process by which we try to differentiate our organization, our company, via digital technology in order to gain competitive advantage. Right. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit. I see people nodding, but I want everyone on board before we start to dig in any deeper. So, first of all, I did some time in marketing. I even read a marketing book once. Uh, and what I gleaned is that really and truly the purpose of differentiation is to gain competitive advantage. Right? You know, differentiate or die and all that kind of stuff. And you're nodding. So I think that's something we can agree on. We can kind of put that part of the definition to bed and say, okay, we agree on that. I like to uncompress the notion of an organization or a company. I'm going to try to stand out of the way. Uh, as not just your products and services, but really products, services, and your people, your culture. You know, some of the other talks I give really are on kind of the stump speech of mine that, that digitization by itself is not transformative. And there's two sides of the same coin, but technology is one side and the people is the other. And so let's combine and expand our thought of what a, a business is to include the culture of that organization. And then what is digital technology? Like I said, I'm a biased guy, I'm a software guy. So I consider it software. And I justify that by saying, well, you know, hardware has become increasingly commoditized. It's ubiquitous. You know, no one in the industry is really making money and margin off of hardware products these days. You know, we talk about Internet of Things and sensors and all that sort of thing, and they're becoming very inexpensive, very easy to deploy. And by themselves, your business doesn't differentiate by the use of hardware. What differentiates you is how you use that hardware, which is generally defined in software. So for now, we'll describe software as the core of what I mean when I say digital. So ultimately, we're talking about differentiating your business via software. Everyone nodding, everyone kind of agreeing, like, okay, I got you so far, all right. So, of the many facets of digital transformation, I'm gonna to try to cover three, and only three today. And as I do that, I'm also, you know, gonna to try to get you know, a little bit of kind of participation from you in the form of three questions. And I just want you to keep in mind, you know, as you take notes or as you think about what I'm saying, you know, just these three points. First of all, where are you today? Where is your business today? Do you feel like you're on the offense or you're on the defense? Do you feel like you're ready to disrupt the vertical you're in or the industry you're in? Or do you, are you in fear of being disrupted? And then as you think about that, a lot of times names pop to mind, right? You know, the names of competitors, Customers, potential customers, potential competitors. So capture those thoughts you know, while you're here today. And then maybe the most important question, though, is how does this inspire me? So we're talking about transformation. And transformation, inherently, it's, it's change, right? And change is hard. Change consumes a tremendous amount of energy. So where do you get that energy? Well, inspiration is a potential source of energy, unlike any other. So... I'm going to cover three facets, hopefully paint some very broad pictures here, some concepts to consider that you'll find something inspiring about. So keep in mind these three questions, three facets, and we'll dig in. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm going to use embarrassing photos of my kids for as long as I possibly can. So um, they're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> Number one, our customers and our relationship with our customers are very much changing. It's evolving. See, once upon a time, 
this was a decent illustration of how we would communicate with our customers. And that may be customers in the marketplace, it may be the customers that we service inside an organization as an IT operation shop and trying to service you know, the inside of the organization, the employees. Um, it's one to many. You, know, you think about how you broadcast messaging, all the traditional forms of communication, be it TV, radio, print, outdoor advertising. Generally speaking, you're putting one message out there uh, with very little control over who consumes that message, when they consume it, how they consume it, etc. You, know, you put a billboard up on the side of the road and everyone gets it as they drive by. Very little targeting. And then this thing came along called the internet. And you know, if we were in marketing at the time, you thought this was like the holy grail, nirvana. You know, we achieved one-to-one -one communication. We knew that we could personalize an email. You know, I could control what content was in the email, what time. It, it could change dynamically based on where the email was delivered to, what time of day it was delivered. I could tie it back to specific campaigns. We thought this was a fantastic thing, and our jobs were fundamentally changed. But then something else happened. In 2015, Microsoft released a study that basically said, in the year 2000, our average attention span was 12 seconds. You know, we're getting bombarded with a lot of information, but we're hanging in there at 12 seconds per message. By 2013, that had dropped to only 8 seconds. Now, by itself, that's a pretty fundamental shift, right? Talk about dropping the average attention span by a third, roughly. But something else kind of interesting happened about that same time. We got passed by the goldfish. Nine seconds of attention span for a goldfish, eight seconds for us. And that was really a side effect of what was happening out there in the lives of our audiences, of our constituents, our customers. And what was once, you know, one-to-one -one communication it was fundamentally changing. They wanted to interact with us in different ways. You talk about, you know, you hear the phrase digital natives? This is it. This is years ago. They were only less than two years old at that time. Each have their own tablets, interacting with technology as if they were born with it, which for all practical purposes they were. So this customer has been distracted. I've got my hands full. Normally, this is where I would say, you know what? I need to take a selfie with the audience because I like doing that, and I'll tweet it later. You know. What was one-to-one one and one-to-many is now what I call one-to-network. And it has all of the potential of one-to-one -one communication, all of the scale of one-to-many, and some very interesting uh, powers and ways to leverage that. But the question is always, well, how do you leverage it, right? So who here is a fan of McDonald's all-day breakfast? Totally, yeah. I've got the app, I've got my loyalty points in there. So all-day breakfast came about because companies were looking to leverage, am I okay on time here? Okay. <laughs> uh, so companies were looking to leverage a shift some sort of innovation in the fast food industry, right? It's, it's been on decline for, for years. Their analysts looked at all of the people that were lamenting via Twitter the fact that they couldn't get an Egg McMuffin after 10 a.m. and decided, okay, introducing all-day breakfast could represent roughly a 2% bump quarter over quarter in sales. And for a North American business, that's about $8.5 billion in revenue, 2% of $8.5 billion is a decent little bump. Right? But logistically, it's a challenge, and it's not something you want to fail at. They're already the, like North America's largest consumer of eggs. You know, McDonald's North America uses about a billion eggs per year. So introducing all-day breakfast could have its challenges and risk associated, right? So if we're going to launch this and make sure it has the highest chance of success, how do we do that? Well, you go right back to that base. They actually employed a small army of people at the time. Um, much of this could be automated today, but they directly responded to 88,000 people saying, hey, I saw that you really wanted that Egg McMuffin at 1130. We heard you. Here you go. We're launching all day breakfast. Tell your friends. And they combined it with you know, a library of assets, shareable images, videos, etc. And the results were surprising. You know, they, they saw actually a 5.2% lift in the quarter. Double their estimates, you know, represents you know, a good half billion dollars annualized you know, over the course of the year. But the trouble is that type of change, that type of innovation, it's hard, right? 
And that was a big, big shift in the way they were thinking and the way they tried to monetize and pull it off. Which brings us to the second point, innovation. It's not easy. This stroller here, I swear, one of the like, best examples of engineering I've ever seen. It had four-wheel independent suspension, had a steering wheel on the back. It was great. People, again, smarter than me, talk about innovation. Why is it hard? Why do we do that? Well, you know, it's hard to come up with new ideas when we use the same thinking that created the problems. But even more so than that, I did a little research, and these are the kinds of jokes and the way we talk about innovation in corporate life. It's, you know, I've been on technical teams. I'm a former engineer, and so it's easy to have, a you know, have an idea, and your peers say, hey, you go run that up the ladder, and I want no part of it because I've been there, done that, tried that. And we joke about it, but then I did a little more research. I said, hey, look, let's reach out in my network, let's do some Google searches, and say, all right, how really are we talking about innovation inside the corporate environment? And there's no good examples. You know, there's processes like this, like this, this one. This is just new revenue ideas, how to fund an innovation, not actually how to communicate it, commercialize it, etc. Uh, someone sent me this, and I have no idea what they're trying to communicate here. I'm sure you're supposed to do something at the peak amplitude, or but, yeah, but we make it really, really hard to come up with good ideas and try them out inside corporate America. And it doesn't have to be that way. So a lot of times people ask me and they conflate you know, digital transformation with, with being agile, and you'll hear a lot of talk about that. And so what I want to try to do is relate the two, but without jumping into trying to be an agile consultant because there's lots of those out there and there's a thousand different flavors and I don't, you know, that's not my expertise. But let's talk through a sample project. Let's think about something simple like, hey, we just want to move stuff from point A to point B. Okay, pretty simple thing. It could be physical stuff, it could be digital stuff, but we've got to move stuff. The old solution, we would get together, architect and engineer a plan. You know, some comprehensive blueprint as indicated by my clip art. And then we would step into a project team and a regular cadence and start working against that plan, right? And it looks something kind of like this. We hit a milestone, we deliver something to our internal customer and say, hey, look, we, we built a wheel. This is great. And the customer says, that's wonderful. I don't really understand how it relates. It doesn't solve my problem. But we're proud of ourselves because we're engineers and we think it's a great accomplishment. And so we go back and we figure out, hey, we can do this over and over again. We can make a lot of wheels. We're still not helping the customer. And so on and so forth until maybe we finish and deliver that final product. But I've been on teams, and some of you guys may have been as well, that get to point three and the project dies. Because we haven't delivered value to the customer yet. You know, we're six, nine months in, a ton of money's been sunk into it, and they're not seeing the results. So the project gets canned. The agile way would imply hey, let's try something small. Let's just throw some, ro um, some you know, rollers on a pallet and see what the customer thinks. Eh, it's okay, but did we learn something? Maybe we did. If we learned that, hey, we need to steer or we need to power that you know, pallet on a skateboard, now we've got a better idea. We can start iterating on that. We can iterate increasingly quickly and the customer is seeing, hey, they are solving my problem better and better every time they deliver something to me. And in the end, What's really beautiful is we often come up with a better solution than the one we would have originally designed 9 or 12 months ago. So I like to sum up Agile this way for anyone that's here. It doesn't have to be a bunch of jargon we don't understand. It can be simple. You think big, you act small, you fail cheap. Because from a business perspective, fail fast really means fail cheap, right? But most importantly, we want to learn fast. That's where you gain strategic advantage in becoming more agile. And again, I'll lean on people smarter than me, CIO of Intercontinental Hotels Group. It's no longer the big beating the small, it's the fast beating the slow. The more you learn faster than your competition, the greater your chances of creating strategic differentiation. So we'll jump into the third and final point. Everything being connected. Not always a good thing. My daughter was not pleased that all that was connected right there. With triplets, I aspire to this level of automation in my home. 
This would be fantastic in the mornings before school. Push a button, pancakes fly out, the kids are happy, we're good. I'm a geek, I'm an early adopter, I've not achieved this. I have, however, seen this, where you have to wait for the fridge to upgrade windows so you can switch from crushed ice to cube ice. So we're not there yet. But we're working on it. In fact, studies vary, but most people will concede that we're looking at 20 plus billion devices by now, end of this year, connected to the web, or connected to each other in some form or another. And it spans different industries, but the thing to note here is that the global population is around 7 billion. And so we're already far exceeding two devices per person, and this number is growing much faster than the global population, right? It's so much so that, and this is where I get a little bit technical and geeky, the powers that be, the people much, much smarter, the creators and designers of the internet, uh, have decided this is something we've got to tackle. There's something on the internet called an IP, Internet Protocol. It's kind of like your phone number. You know, I call your phone, and, or your, your phone number, and your phone rings, no one else's rings around you, etc. So it's a way to uniquely identify a device that's out there. Okay? The version of Internet Protocol, or IP, that we're operating on primarily today is IPv4, and it's a 32-bit number. That means there's roughly four and a half billion unique possible combinations. So we already have fewer unique possible combinations than we have devices out there. And we found plenty of workarounds to that, but it's not sustainable. So smart people got together and said, you know what? Let's introduce a new version. And a lot of organizations are struggling with this right now. It's called IPv6. And it takes that 32-bit number out to 128 bits, which is such a magnitude increase. They said, you know what? We can just divide it in half. We'll give 64 bits to you inside your network, and then we'll save 64 bits just to identify your network. Okay. So remember, the entire internet today is 32 bits, two to the 32nd power. And I'm not great at math, but I'm Chinese, which helps. Two to the 64th is not double the internet, it's the internet squared. That means this is the number, anyone wanna read this one out loud? Let's take a crack at it. We'll call it 18 and a half quintillion. That's the number of smart light bulbs you can have in your home, just your house. And people are you know, freaking out a little bit because or we think, okay, well, that means there's 18 and a half quintillion devices out there for me to interact with, for me to secure, for me to control, for me to understand and be compatible with. Well, that's not all. Remember, 64 bits, 18 and a half quintillion is the number of devices you can have inside your network. There's also 18 and a half quintillion networks, each with up to 18 and a half quintillion devices inside them. I say this because I want people to understand the magnitude of the change as we see it. If you're in technology, when you start thinking about the Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things, this is the volume of sensors, data points, of devices, of things that are out there when we talk about the Internet of Things. And this is just scratching the surface. So what do you do with 18 and a half quintillion networks of 18 and a half quintillion products? Besides, go, no! Well, let's look back at our three questions we started with. Some of you, you know, you've been nodding along, you've been you know, kind of understanding you know, some of this. Hopefully, you've started to see, okay, these are places where I can go on the offense instead of be on the defense. These are places where I can disrupt instead of be disrupted. Hopefully, some of this is inspiring to you. At the end of the day, that's a lot to eat, but you do it one bite at a time. And just by being here, you've taken a step towards that. So I'll leave you with just a few points relating back to the three facets that we covered today. One, focus on your customers. Remember the notion of one to network. Your customers, your constituents, they actually want to share the experience of working with you. That's a very, very powerful thing. Innovate, think big, act small, fail cheap, learn fast. Connect by coming to events like this. And ultimately, the transformation will occur. Okay. Um, one other thing, as a sort of an inside sneak peek that you guys get by coming here today, 
we've been working on sort of addressing, I think it's called Pearson's Law. You know, what gets measured gets improved, and what gets measured and reported improves exponentially. There's not a great way to measure digital transformation right now. And so we've been working on creating one. So I'd encourage you to either you know, hit the QR code or it's in the flyer, or just go to digitaltransformationmeter.com. It's something my company and the folks over at Tisby have been working on together to try to create a benchmark. And you can do it, especially within your executive team, compare your own scores and start to say, okay, let's get the conversation going. How are we scoring? How far are we down that road of transformation? Okay. I see a couple of people snapping pictures. Great. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.